God is good. Would you please be seated? It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. We are here because we have a reason to be here to worship this mighty, awesome God that we call our Lord and our Savior. This, I'm Pastor Kip. I'm the senior pastor here. Normally you see Gary, but Gary is away preaching at a pregnancy seminar. In fact, a lot of Sundays when you don't see him here, we used to think he was in Columbia. Gary preaches all over, really, the southeast uh, at these different conferences, and so that is, he is a very renowned speaker in that area, and so God is using him there this morning in Atlanta, so that's where he is, hallelujah. So I welcome you, if you're a first-timer, uh, here's what we would ask you, not just that, just a visitor with us. In your bulletin, would you pull out that Connect With Us card? And you will see some information we're asking you for. If you feel comfortable in giving us that information, we would greatly appreciate it. We simply go write you a, a, uh, an email, send you an email, or send you snail mail just to welcome you and tell you a little bit about our church. And we want you to come back. We want you to experience the presence of God in this place. The Holy Spirit of God fills us, and we fill this place with praise. And so you're here. We pray God blesses you in his presence this morning. Anything I forgot? Do you remember? Anything else? Okay, we're good to go. Let's pray. Father, you're good and precious and holy. I thank you for Jesus Christ, for the privilege you give us, oh God, to worship you today in spirit and in truth. I pray, God, you would take over every moment of this service. I pray you'd take over our mind, our hearts, our emotions. I pray even, Father, for those who don't feel like worshiping today, that in the power of your Holy Spirit you would strengthen them, oh God, so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, and we will give you praise because you, O oh God, are good. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Calling on the name of Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Let's stand together. Every time I call on the name of Jesus, something happens.
God, you've taught us that we are to call on you, our healer, our provider, our protector. You are our all in all. And this morning, we come to you, and we give you praise, and we put our trust in you, Father God, because you are good. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your paths straight.
Be with us as we trust you today, as we talk about topics that are um, difficult and challenging and make us feel uncomfortable. Help us to trust you, for you to be a place where we can find safety and ref refuge and the strength to apply your word to our lives. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We're going to invite our children to go to their classes at this time. So kids, if you would make your way to the back. You'll meet your teachers. And adults, we're going to stand and gather together. Let's praise them in the sanctuary and love each other, greet each other in the name of the Lord.
you're making your way back to your seats. If you're making your way back to your seats. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Hey, did you pay the God is good. As we go to prayer this morning, no. uh, I want to just uh, remind you of uh, those people in the Carolinas. Got a lot of, uh, can we hold the video just a second, please, uh, Matt? We got a lot of folks in the Carolinas who are underwater. And um, Debbie and I know a lot of folks down there. And uh, so we just ask you to pray. I got family down there. Uh, everybody, family wise, is, is uh, okay right now. And uh, we expect that to continue. But it's just been some really uh, difficult days for the folks in the Carolinas. And so uh, Florence uh, has dumped just so much water. My goodness. So. I read this morning that something like 10 people had died uh, through, through Florence, and so let's just remember those um, in that area of the world. Uh, let's pray. God, you're good and precious. You're holy. I thank you, God, that there's nothing that escapes uh, your mind, your understanding. You know all things, Father. You knew about Florence before she ever appeared. And so, Father, I pray in that knowledge that you, God, would be with the people in the midst of that storm. Be with the, the first responders. Be with those who are even trapped right now. Father, I pray that uh, people would see the grace of God in the very midst of, uh, of this turmoil. Father, I'm reminded of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee who hushed the storm. I pray, oh, Father, you would hush the storm, that you would stop the rising of the water. You would save people from peril, Father. I pray the church, oh God, would, um, uh, would be raised up through this suffering and through this struggle, through this tribulation, and you would use the, tr the church, oh God, to be the extension of the love of God. And then, Father, I pray uh, all around the world for people in similar struggles. Uh, in Asia, Father, with the typhoon, I pray for them as well. And I just pray for the times that we are in, Father, and I pray for the grace of God uh, to not be overcome with fear or trepidation, but to know that you know all things and that you take care of your people. So take care of your church, oh God. I pray that I'm, I'm grateful to, for those who are here this morning for this series. And I know, Father, that there'll be things through this series that are difficult for some. Uh, particularly, Father, is uh, things that I say that will bring memories um, up of uh, what could have been or what was or why did I do this or why didn't I do that. And so I pray, oh God, that, um, that your spirit would meet us right where, we, where each one of us is. Whether we're single, divorced, or married, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would use your text, your words, for my words, oh Father. You would use my words to accomplish your will and your purpose. And I'll give you praise. In the good, holy, marvelous name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen and hallelujah. Let's pray, play the video now, Matt, if you will. Hey, did you pay the cable bill today? No. Didn't you have a lunch break today? Welcome to That's So Mature, the game show for married couples who want to go the distance, beat the odds, and put the relation back in their relationship and build a loving and lasting godly relationship. What do you say? Want to play? Absolutely. When is dinner? Super. The rules are simple. When you hear this buzzer, you have the opportunity to rephrase a thoughtless comment and make it thoughtful. A chance for a meaningful conversation rather than a meaningless one. Scott, let's start with you. Welcome to round one of That's So Mature. That's So Mature. Scott, you began the conversation insinuating that your wife should have been able to pay the bill while she was at work. How can you rephrase that and make it more positive and engaging encounter? Um, hi, um, sweetheart. Uh, why didn't you have time to pay the bill today? What? What's wrong with that? The answer we were looking for was, how was your day? 
How was your day? <laughs> That's implied, I isn't it? Okay, all right. Um, how was your day today, sweetheart? Super, excellent work, Scott. Now, Charla, your turn. Answer this question. How was your day? Well, I went to work this morning, and as I was driving, there was a guy driving next to me in a Honda. Well, no, it wasn't a Honda. It was a Datsun. Wait, no, they don't make Datsuns anymore. You know what? What was the car that your cousin Rip drove? You know, the <laughs> one that we always said looked like a pregnant ferret? Anyway, he was wearing the same colored shirt you were wearing. So I got to work and I walked in like normal and Diane was sitting at the front. Wait, I wasn't even halfway through my day. Exactly. <coughs> no one needs uh, that many details. The question was, how was your day? Not, give me a doctoral thesis on your day. Charlie, try that again. Well, babe, to answer your question, um, I went to work and I ran some errands. I actually had a lot more errands than I thought I would have which was not stopping me from having a productive day and included having lunch with my mom. Super work. Nicely done, Charla. So, what's for dinner? What, what's wrong with that? What, I'm starving and it's her night to cook. Yeah, I'm not really clear on that either. It's um, breakfast for dinner, by the way. Awesome, love it. First of all, Scott, don't think with your stomach before you think with your heart. Take the time to let her know that you're happy she had a good day. Isn't that obvious? I mean, why wouldn't I want her to be happy? Well, sometimes I don't really think you care too much about my day. Oh, of course I care. I'm sorry. I should tell you more that I care, babe. Um, I got this. Honey, what can I do to help you with dinner tonight? Oh, that was me. I slipped. I'm sorry. That's a really <laughs> brave offer, babe. I think you mean helpful, not brave. No, I, I think she's referring to the fear I have with those biscuits that explode when you open them. How embarrassing. And that brings us to the lightning round. That doesn't sound good. Two negative. Charla, go. I'm confused. <laughs> Excellent, Charla. Good to express your confusion. Scott. Can I have a biscuit? <laughs> May I have a biscuit? This is not English class, Scott. Do, do you want a biscuit? Excellent. Generosity always wins. Hi, hi, babe. Ah. Okay, this is mature. Hello? Is that what that was? That was interesting. <clears throat> is there a cash prize or something? <laughs> okay, turn with me to Genesis 1. We're going to continue talking about my crazy family. And uh, did, have you noticed the upgrade? Well, I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing when the doghouse is upgraded. Does that mean that I'm going to get in there more often? Does that mean some of you guys are going to join me? What does that mean? So uh, my crazy family today, one with my mate, how can that work? And let me just uh, say this as a beginning. Uh, you may be married uh, today. You may be with your spouse. You may be single and wondering uh, what you do to get a spouse or whatever it might be. But I want you to know that today what we're going to do is going to, we're going to look at some practical ways that um, men and women are attracted to each other and how we are designed by God to meet one another's needs. So whether you're married or single, to me, this would be something that it would be good to listen to because it is very informative. So we're going to look at Genesis 1 first. We're going to start again in verse 27. And so the scripture reads this, so God created man in his own image. That would be man humanity. God created humanity, not Adam, the single person. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, that is humanity. Male and female, he created them. Now over to chapter 2, 
the creation story in detail. We begin there in verse 18 where the Lord says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Interesting. In 18, it's saying it's not good for the man to be alone. And in, verse, in chapter 1, it talks about he creating male and female. In the image of God, he created them, both making up the image of God. And now we see the detail. It's almost like what God's doing in chapter 2 is he's showing the process, showing you and I the process he went through so that he could create man and woman in his image. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now move to verse number 23. And the man said, after the woman is created, and the man said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave or forsake his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Okay, how in the world can it be that God's plan intentionally is that man and woman, husband and wife, be one person? Point number one. The crazy family in Genesis 1 and 2 is packed with intelligent design. The crazy family. In fact, every single one of us is a crazy family. At one point or another, you know what? How in the world did we do such and such as we just watched in the video? That's a crazy family. But the problem is we all are just like that. <laughs> We're all just like that, but it doesn't change the fact that we are still created marriage, husband and wife. We are created by God with his design in mind. In Genesis 2, verse 18, what the, what the Scripture says, I will make a helper fit for him. That word fit is very important. It's neged. It's used in this verse, in, the, in this context, the only place in Scripture. Different translations of the Bible interpret it different ways. For example, I just read the English Standard Version. It translates it fit. doesn't mean that you are as, physically you are fit that you can run a mile or two or three, whatever it might be, doesn't mean that kind of fit. It means fit in the sense of the design works for husband, male, and female together. NIV translates it suitable. New Living Translation says he made them, male and female, just right. He created man and female just right, one for the other. The helper, just right for the other. New English translation, corresponding to. Word commentary. The most literal of all the translations translate it, translates that word not as fit, not as corresponding, not as just right, not as suitable, but as opposite to or opposite like. So that would mean that if it takes male and female together to complete the image of God, that would then mean that if we take the translation opposite like, that there would be things that the man has that the woman has but in a different way. In other words, one might have physical strength, the other might not have physical strength, the purpose of which is that together they will fit together and they will be strong. In other words, there is a fitting, a corresponding to, a just right in God's plan for marriage that is not an accident. The last thing you see in the opening pages of Scripture is any hint of an accident. And I am quite aware that what I'm going to tell you today is so far off of what you will hear in the classroom or in society. It's like night and day. But it doesn't change the fact that I think you can go all the way back to the opening chapters of the Bible and see God revealing his plan for a family in the opening pages. And that plan is like a model. It's like a model that has specific components. 
and each component is present to work together. And that model works in the modern day just as it did all the way back in the beginning. In fact, what I think is beautiful about the picture in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is that Moses wrote the model not knowing what it was designed to do. He's just reporting the facts. You and I now, after scientific discovery, behavioral and otherwise, can see design that is present that the original writer could not even see. It's like what I can see is how true, how complete, how real God's Word is because what is designed scientifically, we see now how it works. For example, we see that there's no less than component in male and female. There's no hint that one is less than the other. Equal worth and equal dignity is present. If it takes male and female to complete the them, that's the divine image. Both of them have to be equal in terms of the worth and value. Otherwise, one would not be necessary. And he says it took male and female to complete the divine image. It takes them to fulfill divine purpose. And lastly, male and female are designed to complete one another. Notice what this text says in verse number 18 again. It says, it says, I will make a helper. I'm sorry. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Something is noticed by God that is an unmet need. So then he says, I will make him a helper fit. Fit means this helper is to fulfill the unmet need of the male. And so what he does is he completes, or rather, they complete one another. Without the male or without the female, they are not complete. Okay, let's look at this picture of two appliances. Matt, next, there we go. You ever, you ever felt like you're a toaster without any toast? In the sense that you're not complete, you can't do what God designed you to do. Marriage is designed so that in that marriage, there is a husband and a wife, and each one, each one of them has a perfect purpose that is significant and cannot be co um, completed and fulfilled unless they both are participating. Has there ever been a time in your marriage where your husband or your wife, uh, either one of them just sort of isolated themselves from you and for whatever the reason found themselves in the doghouse? That's like a toaster doesn't have any toast in it, doesn't have any bread in it. And it's not like the marriage can't survive, but it certainly can't fulfill the purposes that God intended it any more than a toaster can complete its purpose if it doesn't have bread, a coffee maker, a curry coffee maker, they make the best coffee. But you know what? What do you do with a curry if you don't have any water? It's like when a marriage is not, is not, does not have a husband, a man, and a woman who complete one another, both of, and both of them having roles and, and gifts that are used in that marriage, it's like the Keurig without any water. Look at this next picture. Fit can best be seen in this picture in the sense that they fit together. Tell me which part is the female? That's a female. Which part's the male? That's the male. Now, it's not so much about plumbing, <laughs> but you can see that there is a fitting. In fact, in this particular picture, I took it right over here. I took it of one of these devices over here, but here's what I know. If I were to unplug it, energy is not going to be transferred. I mean, if I unplug that device from the, if I unplug the female from the male, then the energy that, that is transferred from one device to the other, the power so that the purpose is fulfilled, it's not going to work. It's like what you see in the physical design is intelligent design. And what should that matter to you? Your marriage 
And how you live it, how I live it, how I participate in it is an act of worship to God. And so God created a marriage. God sustains a marriage. But he sustains it as you and I complete one another in in our home, in our family. Check this next picture. Now, let me explain it because you probably can't see it very well from where you are. Eric, can you give me just a little more through the monitor? Just a little bit more. Now, what I want you to see is a 500-piece puzzle, 500 pieces. Now, what in the world are these two guys looking on the floor for? What? They lost a piece. So what? Good job. So what, what is the purpose of a 500-piece puzzle with a piece missing. It's not complete. Well, you ever had times in your marriage where one of you got mad at the other and you just sort of, even though you're still living in the house, you know, you just sort of pass each other in the hall and, you know, you just went missing? Well, that's not God's plan. But my crazy family, from time to time, I'm sure it's always, okay, okay, yeah. So, okay. But it doesn't change the fact that if I go missing, if you go missing, the marriage is incomplete until both pieces are together fitting as one. When something is missing, they can't work together. Now, it may be that, you know, it may be that, uh, that, that, that work obligations may be that work obligations keep you from fitting. And so you got a spouse working at night and a spouse working in the, in the daytime. How do you think you're going to be able to be one if you have that kind of life as a constant? I'll show you as we continue. Point number two, my crazy family is designed to stay together. Now, I know this does not go along with society, but I'm not here to preach what society tells us. Point number two, my crazy family is designed to, 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 to stay together. The word in, in verse 24 of chapter 2 that is translated whole fast is debak. It is translated in different places in scriptures to mean to cling, to cleave, or to join. i got a belt on right here. There's a, there's a verse in scripture where the word is used to talk about a belt that goes around a waist, and that belt cleaves to the waist. Well, in a marriage, a husband and wife are to cleave to one another. There's another passage in scripture where it's used to describe the scales on a crocodile that cling to the skin of the crocodile. And so in marriage, we are designed, intelligent design says that we're designed to stay together. Thirdly, God gave us super glue to keep our crazy family together. See, here's, here's our dilemma. <laughs> our dilemma is he created us male and female. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. We have always talked, I mean, we talked last Sunday about the differences in men and women. Well, how is it going to work? I've said this is that marriage is God's intelligent design. How is it going to work if, I mean, permanence, how is permanence going to work if we're so different? How is that going to work? See, God has a plan. And that plan causes husband and wife to stay together in spite of the fact that they are so different. And I'm going to show it to you. Before we do, I'm going to show you two videos. The first video is to show you how a man thinks and acts. He's task-oriented. It's a, some of you may have seen this video. It's a dad in Raven Stadium, and he is going to complete a task. Think of men in terms of how we just do things.
I'm done. Now, you can take that and go with it anywhere you want to. But what it amounts to is we are task-oriented. Men are task-oriented. We're fixers. I don't think you'd ever see, a, I'm, maybe so, I don't mean to be chauvinistic, but I don't think that you would see a woman in Raven Stadium and, he's, and she's up there just beating drums and, and, you know, do you agree with me there? Men and women are different. Men, as we said last week, we think in two or three word sentences. Women think in paragraphs, okay? You say to us, help me with this problem, and I proceed to fix the problem for you, whereupon you get mad at me because I've tried to fix it even though you asked me to do that. So men and women are different. And so how do you and I, what does God do? It's, got to be, it's very important. This is God's design. God designed marriage with a man and a woman who are opposite likes. That means he knows that there's going to be some problems keeping them together. So what does he do to provide the super glue? Watch this next video, and then we're going to talk about the super glue. It's just there's all this pressure, you know, and sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and... I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head, and it's relentless, and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. You do have a nail in your head. It is not a copper nail. Are you sure? I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop maybe. trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. Thanks. Ow! Come on, if you would just- Don't! Okay, so, <laughs> how do we stay together with that much difference. Well, here's how God's done it. He superglued us. Again, it's the word hold fast. Hold fast. We see it hinted at in Genesis 2.20. Notice again the presence of an unmet need. The text says, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. It's not about naming the animals. It's about man coming to the place, husbands or wives coming to the place, where we see that apart from the other, our needs are not met. I have unmet needs, and it is in the meeting of those needs that the superglue begins to seal. So wives, you have needs. Husbands, we have needs. So how are we, how do we hold fast to one another? But by meeting those needs. God has designed us so that the husband's needs are met by the wife and the wife's needs are met by the husband. And in fact, let me show you some of that design from the standpoint of a child. This is from an article uh, in uh, parenting.com. Let me just read this to you. Your baby will recognize your scent within days of birth. Researchers have found that three-day-old infants are able to discriminate their mom's milk from someone else's by its smell. 
And not only does your baby know your scent, he loves it too. You're my mommy. What you sound like. Even before your baby was born, when you were about seven months pregnant, your baby started hearing your voice. It's filtered through fluids. By the time you hold him in your arms and coo at him, he already recognizes your voice. And he likes it. In other words, what I'm saying is that God has so designed us so that belonging is communicated chemically in the body. A child can recognize the smell of his mother's milk. How is that possible unless that's designed? How is it possible that a child would know the sound of their mother's voice unless God created it to be so? What you look like. Some people look more like you than others. Not only does your baby recognize your face early on and love looking at it, but by the time she, she or he is 10 to 12 weeks old, she's able to figure out whether other people she meets are the same gender as you are. Female versus male faces. In a series of studies, Paul Quinn, Ph.D., professor of psychology at the University of Delaware, discovered that three- to four-month-old baby, babies prefer to look at female faces. I wonder why that is. So does this mean that babies are programmed to prefer women? Not so fast. It turns out that the babies in these particular studies had mothers as their primary caregiver. In another study, a later study, Quinn found that babies whose fathers were their primary caregiver liked gazing at male faces best. We think the baby uses the caregiver as a standard to compare others, he says. In other words, your baby may look at a new person and wonder, how much are you like the person who takes care of me? In other words, belonging is takes place between the mother or the father and the infant based on how they learn care is given to them. That would say to me that a baby has needs. And when those needs are met, a bonding takes place. And that bonding is just like the bonding that is to take place in a husband-wife relationship. And if a husband or a wife cease to meet the needs of their mate, how does that impact permanence in the relationship? If a husband or a wife has their, meet, their needs met by someone outside of their marriage, so that there is an infidelity, whether physical or emotional, how does that impact their ability in that marriage to have permanence. You see, if someone else meets the needs, even in the studies that I gave you about an infant, if someone else met those needs, what would happen to the infant's relationship to their mother? So do you remember when you first started dating your spouse? Did you, well, is it not true that what we do in those early days is all we do is talk on the telephone? I mean, I remember that. I mean, Deb, I, I don't know how I could, we didn't even have cell phones. I just remember we just talked all the time. How is it that now I'm where I'm at? And I just, you, you know, uh, how'd your day go, honey? Yeah, let me just check this email while you... What's wrong? You're not paying attention to me. Well, I'm listening to you. No, you're not. you got your cell phone in your hand. If you're going to listen to me, listen to me. If you want to look at your cell phone, look at your cell phone. If you want to read the newspaper... Now, you better watch out. The wrong person's speaking over there. Does that not tell me? Now, I would expect Val to say that. 
I believe we just found a guilty man. Let's put him in the doghouse. Let's put him in the doghouse right there. That's exactly right. Maybe it's the newspaper. You come home, maybe it's the news. And your mate's talking to you, whatever it might be, but you, you're not focused, you see. You're not meeting a need. And in the, in, the, in the process of just going through life, your in, our inability to meet needs, what does it do? It affects permanence. It affects the bonding. That's what I believe that God has done in his design. When God says, he says, that, um, uh, he, he says I want the husband to forsake his father and his mother. Cleave. Be joined. I want, I want to be permanent with his spouse, how does he participate in the process through design? He gives us needs that the other mate is supposed to mate meet. Listen to this, the importance of touch to development. The experience of being touched, new research shows, has direct and crucial effects on the growth of the body as well as the mind. Touch is a means of communication so critical that its absence retards growth in infants. According to researchers who are for the first time determining the neurochemical effects of skin-to-skin -skin contact, the new work focuses on the importance of touch itself, not merely as part of, say, a parent's loving presence. The findings may help explain the long-noted syndrome in which infants deprived of direct human contact grow slowly and even die. So maybe you're saying something like this. Well, you know, Pastor, I grew up in a family, and we just were not very affectionate. Well, how do you think that's going to affect your marriage? If you say, well, I grew up in a home, and we just weren't very affectionate, so because I grew up in a home, we weren't very affectionate there, why should I be affectionate? Because I didn't have that environment. No, here's, here's what the research says. Building of trust, devotion, and bonding. Hand-holding and hugging also results in a decrease of the stress hormone, says Matt Hertenstein, an experimental psychologist at DePaul University in Indiana. Quote, having this friendly touch, touch, just somebody simply touching our arm and holding it buffers the physiological consequence of this stressful response. In other words, here's what he's saying. Someone who is in stress, the last thing for you to do is to come up and say, hey, you shouldn't be stressed. Now, everybody can't do I shouldn't tell my wife that, but what I should do is I should go to my wife and I put my arms around her. That's totally different. No, I should put my arms around her because what I've just done is I've decreased cortisol. The cortisol, the chemical that creates stress in us, hugging, hand-holding, decreases that particular chemical. In addition, he says, in addition to calming us down and reducing our stress res response, a friendly touch also increases the release of, the, uh, of oxytocin, also called the cuddle hormone, which affects trust behaviors. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide which basically promotes feelings of devotion, trust, and bonding. In other words, when I put my hand on my wife and touch her, oxytocin is released through skin-to-skin -skin contact, and so is trust and devotion and bonding increased. So if in your marriage you wonder why you don't feel close to your spouse, is it because you never touch one another? We say, well, you know, I, we did that when we were younger. Well, I don't believe the rules change just because you cross age 50. Oxytocin, it doesn't, it doesn't, oxytocin's released through touch. That would also explain why your teenage sons, moms, don't like holding your hands at this stage in their life, which is a good thing. So God gave us super glue to keep our crazy family together. And probably the very, the very foundation of it is oxytocin. In fact, super glue, in order for super glue to work, 
it, it's got to have, if, it, if we're talking about glue, I mean uh, wood, it needs to have polyurethane. Polyurethane is an adherent substance, chemical, that makes it adhere uh, fast and it, and it won't break apart. It's like what God did is he created, he gave us polyurethane to hold fast the marriage together. And that relationship is held fast when we, can, when we meet one another's uh, needs regardless of how long I've been married, how short I've been married, or whether I am thinking about it. So that would say that if you are contemplating marriage at some point, I think there's some books you might enjoy reading. Because here's what I have discovered in my own research. I have discovered that, that a book like His Needs, Her Needs, or The Five Love Languages, those books have in them what I believe Genesis 1 and 2 has. It's like what you can see is the needs that husbands and wives have that were created in us or hardwired in us by God. Wives are hardwired to connect. Husbands are hardwired to connect. Let me give you a list of five needs that are in the book, His Needs, Her Needs. This, this book is a bestseller forever almost. Here's a, these are the first five needs, the most basic. Now, this doesn't mean that every woman has these needs, okay? Doesn't mean that, but it means that by and large, most women have these needs. They may or may not have them in this order of priority, but they all have them. And why can we say they, that? Why can he make the conclusion that most women have them? Because every in research and studies, these are the five needs that keep coming up. Affection, conversation, honesty and openness, financial support, and family commitment. Well, here's what, look at the men's needs. Admiration, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, domestic support, an attractive spouse. What does that mean? That means it matters to your husband what you dress in. And in fact, in my opinion, it, what, this is what the book said in this situation. To me, a husband, what a husband likes his wife to wear is more important than what she likes because it meets a need he has. Why is that? I don't know. Here's what we do, for example. Here's, here's how it gets so, so out of balance. Okay, the, the wife's first need is affection. Well, let me tell you what affection's not. I don't know if I should do that, but... Affection is not, <laughs> I'm not supposed to just hug my wife and say, let's go to bed. I'm not supposed to say, hey, honey, let's just go, uh, let's go hop in the sack. That ain't the way it works. If affection is the top of her list and in affection, oxytocin is released, that's the cuddle hormone. What that says is, Men and women, we, we have things out of kilter. What men, what men do is we associate physical touch with sexual fulfillment. So we touch, and what is our expectation? And what happens in the woman's situation? She can't connect. I got, I got to feel some intimacy here. I'm reading about this in the book. That's how I know it. So... <laughs> So what, what am I saying? Okay, so, so, so guys, no, no, a woman is not a sexual object. Our society, and in fact, not only is a woman not a sexual object, God's design, no matter how far off this is from society, is that your sexual needs and other needs are met by your mate not by someone else. To me, the problem with premarital sex is not in the act of sex itself, although that still is a problem. What I'm saying is what it teaches, our, teaches us is that other people can meet my needs, not my mate. No, God's plan is it's an exclusive meeting of needs. Why is that, you see? The reason is because... When, my unmet, when I have unmet needs, it's like having an overdrawn bank account. 
In fact, he speaks about this in His Needs, Her Needs, and also uh, Gary Chapman speaks about it in the five love languages. It goes this way. Come with me. It goes this way. If, if, I, if I love my wife by, um, by, by holding her, I'm making a deposit into her love bank account. If I love my wife by speaking with her, talking with her, listening to the paragraphs in detail, fully focused, I'm loving my wife. I'm making a deposit in her love bank. If I am honest and open, if I provide for her financially, if I keep a job, if I'm committed to the family, I make deposits into her bank account. I make withdrawals from her bank account. For example, if I have sexual needs without a sense of intimacy in the relationship, or if I won't, don't listen to her, I'm withdrawing from the bank account. Things that I do, you see, make deposits or make withdrawals. It's the same thing for the wife to her husband. If, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's never happened in my house, but let's suppose I painted this doghouse myself. I painted it, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked. And you came up, and you saw my doghouse, and you said, oh, you missed that spot right there. Yeah, there you go. See there? Over here, we got some guilty people. <laughs> guilty people. Yeah, yeah. That's like, I, you missed this spot. Well, wait a minute, honey. Didn't you see the whole thing that I did? Why is it you just noticed this spot? You just made a huge withdrawal from my love, from your, from your love bank account. Because what, what you, what, because what I just felt was disrespected and, and I can't do the job right. That's what I just felt. See, and so we each have a bank account. We each have a bank account, and so we make withdrawals and we make deposits, and suppose the bank account's overdrawn. Here's what happens. Or what can happen. Not what does, but what can happen. Nowadays, husbands and wives work. Two earner families. Most situations. Rare not to be that way. Here's what happens. Husband goes to work. He's got an overdrawn bank account. Needs are not met. Another wife goes to work, overdrawn bank account, needs not met. What happens is one day in the hall, just brush aside, brush on one another. Oxytocin's released. And then one says, you did such a great job on that project yesterday. <laughs> oh, really? You thought so? Oh, thank you so much. The next day, walking down the hallway. Oh, I like that dress you got. You understand where I'm going with this? We have spouses who have unmet needs. And you know what? When you have unmet needs, you are ripe for the pulling of the fruit off the tree. And it's not because you're immoral. It's not because you want to go to bed with somebody else's wife. It's because we don't have any super. We stop putting it on our marriage a long time ago. Now we're isolated. The miracle is that even if you have an overdrawn bank account, 
what studies have also shown for infants who have been deprived of touch is that if we just start touching them again, their health improves. You know, their growth returns to normal. Why is that? It's God's design. God's design is that even when you stumble, or if you don't stumble, but you just have unmet needs, the balance can be changed, you see. In Christ, I can start making deposits again and again and again and again. And how do I do that? I show some affection. I listen to my wife. I support her financially. I demonstrate commitment to the family, you see. Five love languages basically says the same thing. It doesn't talk about the what of the needs. It talks about the how. I can know what my wife's needs are, but if I'm not meeting those needs in her language, it's like I'm not saying I love you. Let me show you. His five words, his five love languages are words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, quality time, receiving gifts. What does that mean? It's very simple. It took me 15 years of marriage to realize that, it, that the way I best said I love you to my wife was to mop the kitchen floor. Because when she came home on a Friday and the house was set and straight and she could walk in because I had cleaned the house and say, she'd say, oh, man, this is so nice. And I'm thinking, what's so big deal about the clean floor? Because you see, what we have a tendency to do is I meet my wife's love needs in my language. And she meets my needs in her language. And so we like one of them's talking French and the other's talking Greek. Because we're different, okay? So what does that mean? i got to know the what of my wife's needs. i got to know the how to meet them. If she feels loved by, um, by me doing acts of service, by making gifts, by words of affirmation, that's how I say I love you. It's interesting in the videos. The guys don't know how to say it. And actually, I'm not so sure the women do either. Well, why is that? It's because we don't know the what and we don't know the how. Well, you know what, Pastor? That's going to take a lot of work, isn't it? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> That's the point, you see. Marriage are created in the image of God. He's the one designed them. And as you and I work together with him, what happens is we experience the perfect completion of marriage that he intends. Now, maybe you're sitting there, maybe you're single and you, or you're divorced, and you say, now, wait a minute, Pastor, are you saying that the only family that really can complete the image of God is when we're married? Absolutely not, because if that were to be the case, Jesus would have been married. The Apostle Paul would have married. The Apostle Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 7, he said, I wish you were like me in the sense that he was single. He said, because a single person is not distracted by the things of a marriage. A married person is distracted by their spouse, so they can't have as much focus on the kingdom of God. He says, I wish you were just like me. So it's not that the scripture says that a single person is not created in the image of God. It's not like that at all. And in fact, a married person, married family, can be just like a single family because they don't put toast in the toaster. Lastly. What is Satan's role in the modern day? I'll tell you what Satan's role is. This is not, this is not rocket science here. Here's what Satan's, Satan's role is. Satan's role is to create reasons why you are not able to meet one of your spouse's needs. In other words, busy lives. Don't have time. Mismatched schedule. Husband works at night, wife works in the day. You pass each other in the night. Can't meet the needs because you never see, any, see each other. Wife goes to work. She's got school at night. She comes home. She studies. We, you both agree she needs to get her degree. But how do you do that and keep the marriage together when there's no way for the wife to meet the husband's needs or vice versa, you see? 
where Satan, he's in the details. And the other one is children first, husband and wife last. What's that mean? You know, the kids go to baseball, they go to Little League, they go to football, they go to whatever. You know, they go to karate. What, what is the deal? I mean, all we do is take the kids everywhere. What does that mean? You, you, you're the last on the list. You're the last on the list. And what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that except for the fact that you are creating the opportunity for an affair. Doesn't mean you're going to have one. But everything is lined up so that it is more likely than otherwise. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not that you intend to. And affairs are physical, but they're also emotional. What does that mean? It's like a, the, the, the person at work, one day she notices you, you're, you're sad, and she says, well, what, what, what's going on? And you say, oh, no, it's nothing. And she says the next day, just being kind. This is a problem sometimes with brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to be kind. And in the process, what happens is a need begins to be met. A man begins to listen to a husband's story. And what happens is we don't have a physical adultery. We have an emotional one. And someone other than my mate who is to meet, meet my needs exclusively begins to meet the needs that she's supposed to meet. And that's where Satan is. He's in the details. So how do we protect each other? Next steps. Okay, here's what it says. You know, here's the thing. Mm, here's the thing. I know this. I, I, I understand this. It's, I, str I prayed about trying to figure out, okay, Lord, where do, where do I go with them at this point? Because, see, here's the thing. We got there are a lot of you in here. You don't want to work on this. In fact, if you were to go back to that list of needs, those list of needs, you, there's been so long since your mate met one of those needs as I've been talking to you. You know what you've been thinking about? So my husband didn't, hadn't done that in years. And what's happened is you have become focused on what you don't have. So much so that you have actually missed a lot of what I've been saying because you're just thinking about what you don't have. And now you, the wounds, the pain will keep you from even discussing it with your spouse because you just don't want to go there. It hurts too much. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Depending upon where you are, there are others in here, and you've got a beautiful, powerful, wonderful marriage. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Maybe you can help someone who needs it. But here's where I ask you to begin. Have a prayer time with the Lord about your marriage. Commit with Him to work on it. Wherever you are, meet you, let, ask the Holy Spirit to come and meet you right where you are. Right where you are. Maybe you're not married yet. So ask the Holy Spirit to get, the, ask the Lord to help you take these needs and put it in your mind. And, 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 and if you have a significant other, how, how does that work in that relationship? You know, are you meeting the needs as God would have you to do in a godly way? Have a prayer time with the Lord, take it to Him, and you just pray it through. Ask Him, God, am I out of your will? Am I out of step? Show me. Show me. And then what I will do, God, is I will commit with you to take baby steps as you enable me to take consistent, regular steps to put deposits into my spouse's love bank, you see. Have that prayer time. And then, when you're ready, ask your spouse to give you a list of her or his five most basic needs. Five most ba basic needs. And ask your spouse to tell you how to help, how he or she can meet your needs. Okay. It's sort of hard, isn't it? You ought to be in my shoes. 
Let's pray. Father, I just pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'd strengthen each one of us right where we are. I want to first pray, Father, for the single or divorced person in this congregation that is hurting right now. Whatever the source of the pain and whatever they're feeling and thinking, I pray that, oh God, you'd be their rod and staff. You would be their rod and staff, Father, that walks them through the pain. For I know, oh Father, that there are often times that sermons must be preached that are difficult for people for reasons that are personal. And I know you are God who meets us in those personal places and loves us through us through them. You don't condemn us. You don't heap guilt and shame upon us. You, oh God, walk us through those valleys. And that is my prayer. Then, Father, I pray for those in this congregation right now, the husbands and wives that, as I have said certain things, that uh, they don't want to go there. Maybe it's been 5, 10, 15 years since this particular need was even on the table. And so it's painful even to think about going there. And I pray you would give that person, Father, the wisdom to wait until their mate is ready to meet the need before they bring it up. But it is my prayer, O oh God, that you would minister to the, fa- to the families, to the individuals in this congregation, so, O oh God, that our marriage might be, our family might be an act of worship to you. Why should we move forward in this area? Because the way we live in our homes is an act of worship to you. You created the family. You designed the family. You gave us the chemicals that, you, that we have to unite and bond the family. So that is clearly what your intention is. So help us to yield to your intentions. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let me just say one word to everyone here. If God's spoken to you in some way, have the courage to come forward and kneel here at the front of the sanctuary. Just tell God you've, you've heard him. Just tell him you've heard him. And let, let him take you from there. And we give you praise, Father, because you're good and holy and precious. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our musicians are going to come down and lead us in a closing prayer. And uh, if you are uh, contemplating joining the church, becoming a member here, now would be the time for you to come forward and share that with me. Let's stand as we sing together.
you bow with me, please, as I bless the offering. Father, I come before you in the marvelous name of Jesus. I lift up, O oh God, our tithes and offerings. I pray for the blessings of our precious Lord Jesus. Extend them, Father. Extend them to reach beyond, Father, the, the walls of this building. Extend them to reach, O oh God, to pay for what is needed in this building. Whether it has to do with budgets or buildings, God, extend it in the same way that you extended food for 5,000, Father, from five loaves and two fish. Bless us, O oh God, as we give in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and hallelujah. You may be seated as our ushers collect our offering. Claire, would you come and stand with me? This is Claire de Cunzo. So, Claire, tell us when, uh, Sherry, could I have a mic just a sec? Could t tell us when you first came to this church. Uh, I came to this church about a year ago last summer. Um, my grandson, who is now going to be 22 next month, he went to the daycare here. And I remembered how nice it was up there. And I was looking for uh, something more than the Catholic religion that I was brought up in. I would go to mass and really not feel like I was there. I just was there listening and genuflecting, but not really getting anything from it. And then I came here, and the first day that I was here, um, I couldn't stop crying. And I just feel like um, it was the Holy Spirit moving mm -hmm. through me, telling me I was in the right place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And uh, Claire comes to join us and become a member and so we welcome you, and I thank you for sharing that story. The whole of it, I was really just thinking about the part when you brought your grandchild here and that that's where you made the connection. But thank you for sharing the whole of it. That's beautiful. That God is good, and that is a testimony that others have said. Yeah. It's like I think uh, Sue Kreiser, Sue Kreiser had a similar testimony that uh, came here in the first Sunday just felt the presence of God's Spirit and has not left. And we are blessed to have the Spirit of God in this place. Amen. Would you be seated? And then when we close in a moment, if you join me at the rear door. Okay, well, I just have a couple announcements this morning for you guys. And the first, I'm going to call Vernice up. She's going to um, share with you about the yard sale and our shred day. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And thanks to you all, Yard Sale and Community Shred Day is back because so many of you asked Val and I about whether or not we're going to do it this year. So we decided, okay, let's get working. Yeah. All right. So both are going to be on the same day, October 13th. So the Yard Sale is going to start at 9.30, but uh, setup time is 8.30. And what we learned from last year is to try to set aside some parking. So at the beginning of the parking lot, we'll have some areas marked off so people can kind of park. All right, did you want to talk a little bit yes, more about Yes, I do. Real quick, like, what I want you to know is this is a great opportunity for you to now start preparing for the holidays. You need to go down in your basement, start cleaning out things, gather those things, what? gather up those old tax papers. I have to go down there enough old. already. Clear all that stuff out. Come on, clear it out and get all that stuff out of there that you want to put up for sale. And let's make this a Vic, great Vic. yard sale. So men start getting busy because you, you know go. we women. Put next to work. That, what do that, you say? That honey do, honey do. So let's just start working on it now. Get ready for the holidays. Uh, and, and Stephanie said, love language. <laughs> love language, amen. That's right. Okay. That, that's so that's definitely you. in my house, I'll tell you. I just want to tell you, this was an answer to prayer. A lot of you know that we've been cleaning out my husband's mother's house for a while. And it was so overwhelming. And I was just trying to think. I said, Lord, I said, you know, years ago, the youth used to have the garage sale here. 
I said, wouldn't that be great? I said, they haven't had it here in a long time. This was last year. So I just kept packing away stuff. And when they talked about the garage sale, I said, thank you, Jesus. I was so <laughs> excited. So that was one of the ways I could you know, dispose of her items. And so it was such a blessing. We couldn't get down here fast enough. So we, um, and then it was just so nice. We got to meet a lot of people in the community that came in. We got to talk to them and just kind of fellowship and fellowship with, you know, the members here. And it was just a blessing all the way around. So I, as we were cleaning up this past year, I just kept putting stuff away. I said, maybe they'll have it again this year. And so when they said they were, I was very excited. So, so cool. please join us. Thank you. <laughs> a couple of things we may have missed. The table co cost is $20. Hey, if you... Right, if for rented tables from the church. If you Think bring your sentences, phone, not paragraphs. That's right. <laughs> if you need, if you need to do just a space and you're going to bring your own table, that's ten dollars. So keep that in mind. And we do ask that anything you bring with you to sell, that you take it with you. Do not leave anything at the church. Amen. Thank you. That I like. That make sure you get that last part. <laughs> yes. If you bring it, take it with you. And I will say that there's actually going to be a church-sponsored table by Lisa Otero. So if you want to sell stuff and you don't want to, you want to donate your stuff to have someone else sell it, Lisa's going to man that table. Okay. So that's it. Oh, cool. Okay, let's stand and we'll close with prayer. And, and uh, Claire's going to join us here and you can welcome her with a Bethany holy hug. Father, you're good and precious and holy. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit today. Be with us now, God, as we go our way. I pray your blessings upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.